That begins to change with writing. And then in 1432 with the rise of the movable type. Why do we have teachers stand up and lecture while students take notes? Because prior to 1432, writing was very expensive. There were very few books. A book took a year of a person's life to copy. It was copied by hand. Only rich people had books or important institutions. So every student came to class. And in a pattern which went back at least as far as Greece and China, the teacher stood up here, wrote on the board, you wrote it down. You were creating your own textbook. After Gutenberg invents movable type, textbooks become cheaper and cheaper. But we, te we keep this in part because we can't figure out how to, how to break out of the, the uh, cultural framework of our professors. And, and while this makes sense as a way of teaching a class that assimilates new information, it is, this is one of the reasons I taped the class. It's irrational to reteach this class. I mean, it's silly for me to stand up here and repeat exactly next time what I said this time. So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to get it done. And so you go through what the new communications are. Right now, we send faxes, but faxes are simply electronic transmissions of traditional writing. Faxes are an interchange, in a sense, between, they're part of the breaking down. When you start to send email, you're moving to the next stage. And so these things keep cycling. Um, what I'd like you to think about doing, and the way I'd recommend you do it, is as you take each of these aspects, then you start applying it to each of the three transitions. How did family change in each wave? How did work change in each wave? How are things different? And it's very important to understand when you start talking about the third wave that we are not in the mature phase. We are as developed in the third wave as the airplane was in 1908. That is, because people will start, to, you run into really smart people say, oh, well, we're over here, let me tell you, it's going to be a square. They haven't got a clue. Where, where we are is here. The old world is breaking down and the new world is vaguely emerging. One of the most interesting books on this, by the way, is Hoising as the Waning of the Middle Ages, which is a study of the psychology of transition and how did the Renaissance look if you were a medieval Christian. Because the Renaissance is always written by secular historians as a good thing. It was a terrifying thing if you were a medieval Christian because it was the breaking down of the known world. It's a brilliant book called The Waning of the Middle Ages by Hoisinger. But my point is, what you can know is you're here. You're not here. You're no longer back here in the second wave. You're not frozen. But we don't have a clue what, the, what a mature third wave civilization will look like. What we know is things are dying, things are breaking down, and other things are emerging, and we're in this middle zone. Now, in that sense, what you've got to try to think through is, how should you think, analyze, plan, and act in a period of decisive change. Notice that they're separate. First you have to think. Then you analyze. Then you plan. Only last do you act. And, it's, and, and you've got to know where you are in terms of the cycle of change to know what, what's an appropriate behavior. In a sense, the, there's a, the, the, the third wave offers dangers and opportunities. It is like the Chinese character for crisis which is made up of two characters, one for danger and the other for opportunity. And we were trying last night to find the character. We didn't, we didn't have it. If we find it by next week, we'll show it to you retrospectively. But, but the, literally, the, the, the word in Chinese for, uh, for crisis is actually made up of two words, danger and opportunity. And so it is literally fair to say, as you were in a sense implying, this is a big problem. I mean, if you're a big winner here, you are now at risk. So that one person's rise, the rise of Microsoft is enorm enormous competition for IBM. The rise of email is an enormous competition for the post office. The rise of an expert system for home diagnostic is a big threat to the family doctor. And so you've got to look at how do people emerge and change and evolve and recognize that everything is both a danger and an opportunity simultaneously. But to grasp that, to grasp the dangers and opportunities of the third wave information age, we have to understand its characteristics, learn its principles, invent new habits, institutions, and systems, and sometimes invent new words and new meanings. Go ahead, Mai. Is this going to be as solid as this? Because when you stop and you think about the agriculture, it lasted much longer, and then the industrial age lasted 300 years. And 
because it changed so rapidly, is it always going to feel like it's, it's in a melting stage? Truth is, we don't know. I mean, this could last for a generation or it could last for a thousand years. We don't know. Because, because we don't know. And it could turn out to be something that is never like this, but is instead very, very flexible and fluid and permanently changing. Why? I don't know. My answer is, I don't know. No one does. We've never been through this in this particular version. But you it's know. not possible to go back, though. Yeah. It is highly unlikely because this system, this is part of the definition, this system is infinitely more competitive. This is the center of productive power. Okay? So what happens to the bush with the Kalahari? Why is it that the only people who survive at hunting and gathering are in marginal ecosystems? Because they all get crowded out of the good spaces. Because they can't compete. I mean, the Bushmen and the Kalahari can't compete with the Roman Legion. They can't compete with the Zulu uh, force. And so they're, they're literally squeezed out of the good spaces into the last, the, the, the desert Shoshone couldn't compete. And so they were pushed into the desert. Because the bigger agricultural system, what happened? This is what the Meiji Restoration is about. All of a sudden, the young leadership of Japan, when Perry arrives from America in 1854, they look around and they go, wow, what happens to every Asian agricultural civilization? It collapses in the face of Europeans. And they suddenly say, we had better change fast. Because if we don't make the transition, we will be non-competitive. We will be run over by the Europeans. And so the question is, I mean, what happened in Desert Shield? In Desert Shield, and I mean, Desert Storm, you had a second wave Iraqi army dealing with an American army that is at least beginning to move into the discontinuity. It was a non-competitive environment. They were just two different worlds. It, it, it gets right back down to survival. It's a survival instinct. Yes. But for the civilization to survive, I think it almost has to shift and make that transition. And what I want to walk you through when we come back, because we're going to start right here, is I want, I want to start with the notion of how do you under, you know, what's the difference between understanding characteristics and understanding principles? And how should you think about this scale of transition? And we're going to stay for a little bit right on this model because this is the thing that I think people find the scariest. Their first reaction to a period of thawing is to cling to the old and to be frightened. Whereas the most effective reaction may be to be very curious about the thawing. To say, gee, that's interesting rather than, boy, does that terrify me. And to try to understand, what does it mean? And that means you have to think about discovering. It goes back to listen, learn, help, and lead. You've got to go into a phase where you can't start thinking about your vision of the future until you listen for a long time and learn what the options are. So it's a very, very important model. And what we're going to try to do then is say, okay, how can I think about this scale of change on a planet-wide basis? And what does, it affect, what does it do about me? I mean, if there are billions of people on the planet and the whole planet's going to go through this thawing process and the whole planet's going to go through this scale of change, then what does that mean for me, for my business, for my family, for my country, for my community? And how can I begin to figure out patterns that are helpful in going through a change on this scale? I think that's the key thing. Okay? So we'll take a break and come running right back and pick up right here. <laughs>